math associated with what the response fund is attempting to address would suggest that uh, that 20 million, even in just a category of very immediate response, is but a fraction of what is needed for uh, the needs of the community and the people who are suffering right now. Issues associated with food security uh, and other challenges, uh, things that have emerged that we didn't necessarily uh, expect to see, like the challenge with uh, people who are experiencing domestic violence uh, or child abuse now being isolated uh, in their homes is, uh, is acute. So we're getting a better sense of it with our, uh, our advisors from the community, uh, but we have a lot more to do. And that maybe gives me an opportunity to just lay the landscape of how to think about uh, civic action and social engagement right now. Uh, the response fund around the country, we were really the first here in Seattle to establish one because of the timing of our unfortunately being the epicenter of this, uh, this outbreak. And we packaged it up and sent it around the country. Uh, we've been in close connection with uh, leaders from government, as well as uh, organizations such as the one I get to lead and corporations in the 30 major metropolitan uh, regions. And we are all seeing a number of similar things that I thought I might share uh, with you to give you some, some context. Uh, we have no doubt that there is a, this immediate category of action that is very focused on individuals impacted. There is clearly a, uh, a second phase and another layer that we have to think about. And the second phase is what some will call recovery. Uh, I would suggest that we think about it more in terms of redesign or reimagination. Uh, I think that this is an opportunity for us to uh, take some action now that doesn't try to establish necessarily the status quo of what we had in terms of societal structures and support for uh, impacted people before the crisis, but actually use the crisis to design some things that allow us to come out uh, better, stronger, more vibrant, more equitable after the crisis. And that is undoubtedly going to be a multi-year uh, effect. For, for those who are listening, who either lead uh, in nonprofit organizations or sit on boards or volunteer for nonprofit organizations, there is another layer beyond the immediate response that has to do with the, uh, the really uh, tremendous challenge that the nonprofit sector has economically as a result of this crisis. Uh, there, there have been some New York Times articles about uh, the challenge of an extinction crisis for many nonprofits. Heather referred to the arts organizations that rely on an earned revenue model in order to sustain their operating budgets to navigate through this. And uh, we are uh, uh, under development with some partners around an approach to try to deal with that longer or mid, mid to long term challenge of how do we support uh, these amazing nonprofits that are pillars of our society and provide so much of a safety net for our community. And to just give you some sizing of that, if you took uh, the nonprofits in King County and asked uh, all of their finance leads uh, how to scope their 18 month problem associated with uh, the impact of this crisis, uh, the early indications are that the aggregate number they would come back with is somewhere between 400 and 600 million dollars. That, that it could be north of that. And for Seattle Foundation and our partners, we consider this to be uh, an obligation to address that in an incredibly uh, careful, thoughtful, but also open way so that we can support having a uh, nonprofit sector that actually exists after this, uh, this crisis is over. And that will be a big effort. Uh, I think that the, the things that are exciting about that is, is that with our partnering with the, the founders of All in Seattle, as, as Heather mentioned, it's an opportunity for us to engage everyone in our community, including high capacity philanthropists, but including also uh, all of the residents and citizens who care about the community in an effort to come together and seek a common we. You know, during crisis, uh, humans have a tendency to break into little we's. There's a lot of opportunity for divisiveness. There's a lot of opportunity for conflict. And what Seattle is now uh, proven with the work that's been done across so many different fronts is we have an opportunity to be a bigger we and to uh, have relationships where being direct uh, is an exemplification of being respectful and that we can navigate resiliently through compromise and through conflict so that we, uh, we can engage uh, each other in the best interest, the mutual gains of our community together. And that will be a, a big task 
and we're just beginning on that phase of it, and we have a lot more to do with regard to uh, response. And a, an important point in there, Tony, is you're talking about you know major nonprofit institutions, arts and cultural organizations that we've known for a long time, and, and you're suggesting that you know there's a survival issue here over the long haul, and how do we come together and, and save them? Yeah, and I think what's important about that is that that cannot just be a top-down thing, and it also cannot just be a disaggregated organization by organization type of effort for it to stand the chance of earning the level of investment that very well could be knocking on a billion dollars. And so what we have to do is think about how do we support these organizations first and foremost in the execution of their mission as it, as it relates to this crisis here and now, but also work with them so that we can support the, uh, the opportunity for both government as well as philanthropic support so that this pillar of our society uh, can be stronger at the end of it. And also on the downside that we don't miss the plot on that such that we will be spending a quarter of a century digging out of even deeper inequitable holes uh, that, are, that are showing up. And just to make sure people are, are cognizant of it, the press is, has been uh, surfacing this to some extent. The racial inequities that existed before this crisis uh, are, are uh, very, in a very sobering and stark way surfacing at uh, an extraordinary uh, degree because of this crisis. So that is both uh, in terms of uh, the evidence of health uh, disparities uh, as a result of challenge systems around that side of the equation, but also economic uh, impact as well. And um, it's, uh, this is a moment of truth for the Seattle region. What I've seen in terms of our qualities is that we are up to the task but it will require our doing things in a different way. And, and uh, I'm, I'm very optimistic that we can step up to it. In, in your comments today, you've talked a lot about just sort of how we're working with one another, individuals, civic nonprofit business leaders. And prior to this crisis, you've, uh, you've talked about this idea of Seattle nice, that we have a tendency to avoid conflict and discomfort uh, and, uh, and, and don't always engage with each other effectively. And you've advocated for a frame of Seattle Real. Do you think we've gotten more real with each other, moved closer to the Seattle Real as you characterized it through this crisis? Yeah, there's no question, John. I, I, I literally see it every day. Uh, I have had to have some discussions with uh, community leaders, nonprofit leaders, philanthropists. Uh, the list goes on government leaders that have been very difficult and also when when successful are have the ingredients of let's agree that we uh, we will assume the best intentions of each other let's be overt with each other about what we're trying to achieve let's surface where we've got conflict let's focus on what of that conflict we can resolve put aside the part that we don't need to resolve if we can't resolve it and uh, and come up with strategies uh, to work together and that is a, that's a, it's a difficult experience. It's a bonding experience. Uh, I go for long walks in the city, sometimes, um, sometimes running to uh, keep myself centered through that. But I, um, I also think that it is exactly what society needs. That is the definition of community. It's not always about, uh, it's nice to be nice to the nice. It's about working problems together. Well, in a lot of ways, we're redesigning, I think, how, how we do work together in Seattle, and, and I think we'll be better for it on the other side. Thank you for all you're doing in the Seattle Foundation and, and your team to uh, Thank help you, our John. community, and not just the immediate response, but to be thinking long term and months and years from now what we need to do uh, to save and preserve and uh, elevate all that we care about in our region. Great. Thank you, I want you, to sir. move to Alice uh, Shobe, who um, leads, uh, directs uh, Amazon in the community. Uh, Amazon uh, has played a number of different roles, not just in this region, but really around the world in, in the markets it exists in, to step up uh, and respond and support uh, individuals, small business, uh, the community in general. We want to focus in on Seattle, Alice, and, and what Amazon has done over the last several weeks to step up uh, to serve uh, small business in our community and the other work you're doing, the work that you've uh, partnered on the, with the Seattle School District. Talk about the approach that you've taken, um, who you've helped, uh, and your outlook from here on, on Amazon's work in response to COVID-19 and the economic impacts. 
Sure. You know, um, I'm inspired by Tony. So I just want to share, you know, how you get those emails occasionally and somebody says something where that you're like, I'm going to tack that on my wall. And I got one of those this morning and this is what it said. Um, don't overestimate what you can do in a year, but don't underestimate what you can do in five years. And I, I think that's really some of the call to action is that bigger thinking. Um, so I just wanted to underscore, I really appreciate um, uh, both Heather and Tony and how they're framing both the urgency of the moment right now, but also the future and the possibility with this clear eyed about we've got some work to do um, along the way. So um, just for context, I would say um, my team started really thinking about COVID in January because uh, disaster relief uh, is part of the Amazon and the community team. And so we were starting to figure out, or we did figure out how to get masks and medical supplies into China for frontline healthcare providers, as well as our own employees. Um, being candid with you, uh, I knew that was happening. We're, you know, we're doing our thing. Um, it's China, it feels a little far away. So on a personal level where I really started to feel it was, I had a global meeting planned in February, in-person meeting that I had to cancel. So that was my first you know, leadership moment of like, what's the right thing to do here? Because the US was still open, but there were all these different travel guidelines. Um, so we've been kind of, our toes have been in the water as a team, but undeniably it's that moment when your employer says, you know, we think you should just like work from home and we'll get back to you. Um, so I recently went back into my office and it just had like, you know, the leftover coffee cup and the papers that were um, there the day, the day I left. Um, so, uh, so we've been in COVID and thinking about it. Um, and how I think about it is both what, um, what Heather and Tony were saying about having key relationships in terms of activating Amazon here locally, um, and being able to use that, um, but also having a foundation of what you do well and really staying true to your purpose um, and then changing your tactics really quickly. And so that's what um, I'm um, excited that our team and the company in general was really able to do. So just as a little bit of context, the Amazon and the community team focuses on young people, primarily those who are economically disadvantaged in the communities around the world where we have offices. And we do that in two areas. One is around STEM education, particularly computer science. And the other is what we call addressing right now needs, um, which has been primarily focused on issues of housing um, and food access. And then, as I mentioned, the disaster relief team is also, is also part of the team. So um, I think you were gonna ask me, so I'll, I'll uh, jump in and say, the first call I made, um, you guys were gonna ask me what call I made, was actually a series of text messages with Chris Herman uh, from the Seattle Foundation who works with Tony in that three-day period that Tony talked about. So it was helpful that um, we had experience with Chris and she gave the vision about what was being worked on, who was already at the table. And so um, it, I was really grateful that Amazon could come in and really help um, launch that fund. And it just to see the wave of support that followed after, but just the, um, the traction and the action um, that happened um, was just remarkable and, and inspiring. And I just wanna just also re-lift up that the way that the Seattle Foundation is also deploying the Pandemic Advisory Committee, frankly, for a company like Amazon was a huge relief because <laughs> we don't have time to have all those individual relationships to understand all the various micro, micro communities that make up our larger community. So knowing that um, the Seattle Foundation and the other partners were gonna be really leveraging their long-term relationships was um, hugely comforting and made it like a no-brainer investment to be frank. So thank you for that. Um, a few of the things as I said, just staying on our purpose of thinking about young people predominantly, but also pivoting um, and doing what we do well. How the Amazon and the community team thinks about our work is we think about, we wanna always try to leverage our customers, our employees, and then something unique about the company. And we think that the home runs are when we can do all three of those things at the same time. So we're looking for those opportunities. Um, and so we didn't, you know, you don't always hit it 100% of the time. But um, some of the things that we have really uh, been able to come in and help the Seattle area community on was one, King County called and said, we're lifting up these isolation and quarantine sites. Um, could you help us think about supplies? And so that was one of our first actions was to go in, go in deep with them, help think about what was needed both from just basic essentials, but also the problem of keeping people entertained so they would also stay um, when they were sick or needed to remain quarantined. 
So uh, one of the first things we did was set up a weekly uh, shipment and it's 250,000 um, items that are going into those sites in King County. Um, and that's been just a great partnership and hats off to King County for how well they uh, jumped on that. Um, and we were glad that we could help. Um, a couple of the other bigger scale things we did was one was the Seattle laptops donation. Um, the benefit of, you know, leveraging our assets is we have relationships with vendors um, at scale. And guess what? Laptops are pretty hard to come by right now. <laughs> they are a, a limited commodity as soon as we all got locked down um, or self-isolating, not locked down. Uh, so we did, we were able to leverage some of our vendor relationships and then work with the Seattle Public Schools to identify the gap um, of laptops. So in addition to what they could already uh, repurpose from their own supplies. The 8,200 was the gap so that the, the school district and the community commit, could commit to serving all the children. Um, with well, the how, did that, uh, how did that come to be? Did they come to you or did you go to them? Uh, we actually went to them. We had been working with the school district previously on robotics clubs in the schools. And then we've had a great uh, partnership with the Alliance for Education. Uh, something called the Right Now Needs Fund, where we've been providing emergency funding, in essence, in every Seattle public school for about 18 months. So with those relationships, um, we had, you know, seen some of the press about laptops are an issue. So we called and we said, can we talk about laptops? Um, and then we literally, um, you know, looked at supplies to see what was available. And that was part of the um, you know, part of the process. It's great that your child just went by, by the way, John. It's, it's real. I love it. It's real. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, we've been able to do that. Um, another, uh, a couple of things that have happened. Um, one is that we've had these big uh, catering contracts that normally feed employees. And Amazon was really um, interested in both keeping those companies solvent um, and, you know, contributing to the economy in that way, but recognizing that we also had a huge resource. So again, to go back to kind of how we think, it's like, What's the problem we want to solve? How could we solve it at scale? Um, so uh, we reached out to the King County and Seattle, Seattle Housing Authorities and said, who are you most worried about food-wise? Uh, we have some contracts that we could repurpose. And so they both uh, honed in on their elderly residents and uh, medically frail residents. And we've been um, providing meals three times a week to 2,700 um, households across um, across the county. So um, that's been, um, was really inspiring. And it was another one of those, like we really lifted that up in about three or four days, identified the populations, redirected the contracts and made that happen. Um, and then the last one that I'll mention is the, um, this was just publicized nationally, but we had been piloting um, really in a bunch of different ways over the last few years about how to think about food delivery differently for low income populations. And so that really paid off um, in these last few weeks and that we saw an opportunity to test using our flex drivers, which are individual contracted drivers to get food from food banks once food banks were closing and trying to figure out how to get the food still to their residents. So we piloted that in Seattle with Food Lifeline, um, Jewish Family Service, some other organizations, and we saw that we could make it work. And just yesterday we announced that we are now scaling that all over the country. Um, so that's, a, you know, really leveraging all the logistical capacity the company had to figure out how to make, instead of going to an Amazon warehouse to pick up something and deliver to somebody, how to go to another community um, uh, partner and deliver, but it's working and um, we're super, super excited about that. So those are a few of the examples of how we have jumped in. Um, it's hard to believe it's only been six or seven weeks, <laughs> but it has. And then how is your small business fund uh, working, Alice? Uh, you've engaged a third party to help provide those grants, is that? Yeah, it's a, it's a combination. Um, but yeah, so that was the other, I would say that the two first big moves we made were the Seattle Foundation and then the small um, business fund. And my colleagues that run the real estate arm of Amazon are most responsible um, for both that vision and that um, execution. They lifted up that fund. So they are, we have accepted applications. We originally pledged five million. I'm pleased to report that we've exceeded that amount, um, and the fund is still providing um, additional grants. And some of the um, some of the uh, stories have been have been incredible. Um, 
So what you're seeing, what just came up on the screen, I, for a minute I thought my computer was blacking out, was I just wanted to point you to a couple of these resources. Amazon has a blog um, where we're doing daily updates. There's the general rolling um, COVID blog that you can read about everything going, around, um, going on around the world. Um, but the HQ community one specifically focuses on what we're doing in Seattle and uh, Virginia, our two headquarters. So you can see kind of a compiled list of those things. So, um, so yeah, we're, we've been super excited to be able to, you know, jump in and as I said, leverage our employees, our customers and the cool things that Amazon does every day uh, to help address the crisis. Well, thanks for sharing that with us, Allison, for all your leadership and making it happen and, and the company too, for stepping up, um, you know, the real estate side and the, the free rent you're providing to your Right. Tenant plus the direct grant support and uh, leveraging your logistic capacity and, uh, and all the other expertise that Amazon has. Uh, Tony talked a bit about um, this period of recovery or redesign and uh, just the, the pressures that it will put on some of our vulnerabilities as a community that we had before we got into this crisis. And I think um, what, in, what in a lot of ways is unique about this economic catastrophe that's hit our country and hit cities is the position that so many of our cities were in before of homeless challenges, affordability issues, inequality, and this collision of this uh, economic tsunami with those weaknesses. And I, I want to just ask each of you, your outlook over the next year in regards to those issues, the systems, those most in need in our community, um, and, and how do we move to a period of sort of redesigning? What does that look like? What does it mean to you? And where do you see the greatest vulnerabilities in the Seattle region uh, to the economic impacts over, over the longer haul here? Uh, I, I, maybe I'll go first. I, you know, I'm not an expert in this area. And I, I always say, uh, you know, that I tend to be dragged into these discussions as sort of the only civilian. Uh, well, I like that you volunteered to go first then, Heather. Right, because, because then I can't be wrong because I'll have, you know, be corrected by everybody else, which is useful. Um, yeah, it's, it, I, I hope the time frame is longer than a year because I think, you know, for the next year, there's probably going to be a lot of just stabilization and, um, and, and need to uh, uh, just sort of keep the lights on. Um, I, I want to, you know, double click a little bit on what Tony said. I, I, when I've been framing this for our investors um, in, in Flying Fish and for our portfolio companies, um, what I have talked about is, is disruption. And um, when you have disruption uh, caused by a recession, it's a really great opportunity for people like me to invest. And so, you know, a lot of people on this call are business people and entrepreneurs and uh, people who are, you know, engaged in the for-profit side. And, and so we, you know, we all, we all have investments <laughs> and those are under stress. Um, but we also have capital to deploy and that capital can be um, human capital, that capital can be you know, dollars, it can be, be come in a bunch of different forms, including relationships as, as Tony and Alice both mentioned. Um, so, you know, the, the hard part I think for um, uh, less nimble uh, organizations, which includes government and, and in some degree includes the, the nonprofit sector, um, is to think about this disruption and think about it as an opportunity in a couple of different ways. I mean, the good news is I think humans are actually more adaptable to a fast disruption than they are to a slow disruption. I mean, this is why climate change is so hard, right? Is it's a slow moving disaster. So we've had two very big disruptions, one being this you know, huge economic disruption, a recession that you know, will probably be uh, one for the record books. And then we've also had this huge disruption in human behavior. We're all being asked to live very different lives um, than we were uh, prior to this crisis. And so that allows from an investment standpoint for a great deal of opportunity because whenever you have change you have room you know to squeeze your little thing in there and create something new it also creates great risk to existing businesses for the nonprofit and government sector i'm already seeing and tony is a good exemplar of this is the nonprofit sector is saying this gives us a chance to reinvent 
you know, inertia and politics in good times means that it's very hard to change things and to stop doing things. But in bad times, those inequities, those, you know, persistent problems, those inefficient systems are revealed. And so you can, through necessity as well as um, motivation, you can change those things. And I think that, you know, some of the bigger think stuff that Tony alluded to about the longer road and how we preserve, um, not, we're not gonna preserve every nonprofit institution necessarily, and we're not gonna preserve every program necessarily or every job, um, but we are gonna preserve the what's best and what's needed in the future in those organizations. Now government, I'm more pessimistic about, you know, because I think politics still do play a major role and inertia is very powerful and, um, you know, structures uh, like, um, uh, you know, long, long term public employee structures and all of that create a lot of drag on the ability to create change. But my hope is that there will be um, the ability to both stop doing things that don't make sense and to start doing things that do make sense and a lot of creativity in that area so that it could be looked at more like a uh, venture capitalist would in the sense of this is an opportunity to stop doing things but to start doing things and to redeploy capital in ways that will build something for the long run. Um, so from a commercial, you know, sort of standpoint, particularly in the sector that I'm in, early stage tech, I'm super optimistic and looking at this as a tremendous opportunity um, for, for capital to be deployed productively. It's a harder um, shift in these two other sectors of the nonprofit and the, and the government sectors, but I think with some political will, um, you can get there. And I think Tony is a huge proponent of getting there on the nonprofit sector side. And we just need to do everything we can to support and um, encourage our electeds to think similarly. Really appreciate your perspective on the, the pace of this change and disruption. And sometimes maybe we're more resilient and adaptable uh, when the pace is, is quick and sudden than if it's uh, slow. So. Yeah. Appreciate that perspective. Tony, Alice? Well, maybe I'll let Alice uh, close us out on this. Um, but I would say what's important to recognize, and this was true before this crisis, but it is not commonly understood for very, um, very understandable reasons. And that is there's a socioeconomic capitalist, democratic, fact-based algorithm. That is that we all do better when we all do better. And the concept of shared prosperity and how we actually are creating a system uh, and a society that has a just democracy, that has a more equitable economy that is more inclusive of all of our uh, neighbors, and that also considers uh, having a resilient environment, both built and natural as a, as a, a, a first principle, is, is in fact an achievable thing. Uh, the complexity and about that is that without our uh, looking at this in terms of a uh, a marathon, not a sprint, and giving each other grace to have these kinds of discussions and to think about innovative solutions. Seattle is, we talk about it, we are a pioneering innovative community. We have an opportunity to apply that pioneering innovative set of experiences, amazing corporations, incredible civic leaders, uh, great electeds trying to do uh, so many good things in so many areas of our, of our broad multi-county region uh, to, uh, to, to get after this. And uh, our, our residents deserve that. I, I share some of Heather's uh, concerns about the challenges of doing that. The uh, humans can, just to follow on her comment about the homo sapien, uh, they can uh, lull into complacency and uh, it's important that we not do this. This is going to be hard work for a, for a while. And to take it out of abstractions, what I think that means is for the business leaders on this call, for the, the nonprofit leaders on this call, uh, take some time to reflect in terms of your strategy around uh, what you might do differently and how you might partner differently through this. And that's, that is a good start. 
Uh, the old playbook is out the window. Let it be out the window. Let's start uh, writing the new one. And I, you know, I was, I was just thinking about what, Am what Amazon has uh, been doing uh, to define itself in this respect, and what Heather, or excuse me, what Alice is describing is is a, is a great example of that. You know, we we uh, we have amazing corporate leaders in this community, and there's uh, there's so much good that they are doing, and so much good that they will do. So, over to you, Alice. I'll just end with a quick thought because I know you want some Q and A time. Um, as many people know, I spent my entire career in the social sector before starting at Amazon. And so one thing that's really um, hit me is, um, I think what we're learning is to have our purpose clear, uh, to define the problem in a big way that we want to solve, but take a big bite and solve it as fast as we can, um, and then move on to the next one. So I think in addition to Tony's comment about nice Seattle, I think we've also had um, you know, sometimes too much focus on the big problem and we get overwhelmed with it and then we never get even a small pipe, you know, piece of the problem solved. So that's, I think, one of the things that's been really rewarding is this big bite of the pie problem solving without losing our bigger sense of purpose and focus. Um, and so I really hope we can bring that into our future together because I think we'll get a lot more done and a lot more people will benefit um, if, we, if we go into that mindset and action um, mode. Yeah, amen. And, and there'll be uh, some of those same problems waiting for us on the other side of this that we need to take uh, this approach to, to go after. Well, I do want to now open it up to your questions. We would like to take these uh, live and uh, Emily will unmute you and we'll have you introduce yourself and uh, your uh, role organization company and, uh, and direct your question to the panel. This is Emily. As a reminder, you have a little hand at the bottom of your screen that you can press to indicate that you have a question. We don't currently have anybody. We'll leave the floor open for a little while longer for uh, your questions. Can we have one from another Emily? Um, Emily, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Okay. Hi, this is Emily Diddy. I'm the Chief Development Officer with Fair Start, and we are so grateful because everybody on this panel has supported our extremely quick pivot to now, I think, providing over 200,000 meals to the community as of today. My question, thank you, Alice. Um, my question is, uh, we're, we're trying to fill in gaps as we're noticing them and also uh, communicating that back to a variety of resources that are out there. I feel like I'm on video chats all the time and Tony and your team have been incredibly accessible and we're really grateful for that. What do you see thinking about this private um, philanthropy sector and working with um, Alice and Amazon? What do you see as like a future possibility of bringing more people together and looking at the many places in which I think we still have areas that need addressing? Obviously, one of my concerns is prepared meals and like where that fits into the, the food conversation um, for people who don't have access to kitchens, who may not even have a kitchen, you know, things like that. So I just love to hear more from the team on what are the next steps and where are we going to start to dive into some of these things that maybe were not immediately um, visible. Do you want me to take that first, John, and maybe Alice and Heather might have some comments? Please. Yeah, Emily, thank you. Um, and it's, uh, it's important to recognize for those who aren't familiar with the impact that Fair Start is having, um, get, get online. It's, uh, it's an amazing organization. Emily, thank you to you, Angela, the rest of the, the Fair Start team. Uh, one way to, I think, uh, answer the question is to say, before this crisis, we had a, a dilemma with regard to generosity in our country. Uh, wealth was growing at about eight or nine percent, and only about one percent was going towards any type of social good. And when you look at the pattern of large gifts, gifts in the tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, that they, they were benefiting for very good reasons, uh, large institutions like universities and hospitals. And that uh, that should continue. In fact, that should increase because if you think about the gap between wealth creation and uh, and generosity there's more than enough headroom. The complexity, uh, Emily, for uh, the, the philanthropic sector to address the needs that you, that my team, uh, that Alice and, and the work she does, uh, that Heather inspires giving towards, 
to, to, to uh, uh, amplify on the community side of the equation is that it's a very, uh, if you think about it as an investor, it's a very messy ecosystem of a lot of different programs, a lot of organizations, uh, some of them large, some of them small, some of them known, some of them unknown. And the complexity of that ecosystem for a social impact investor, i.e. a charitable person or a philanthropist, has, we believe, uh, diluted the ability for people to make big bet investments. And so one of the things that, that you'll see us work with, with you and your colleagues and others in the, in the nonprofit space to do is to arrange our, uh, our investment opportunity together in a more coherent way to appreciate much larger scaled investments to community. A community like Seattle should be receiving $100 million gifts, billion dollar gifts, in landing them into organizations like Fair Start. And, uh, and there's great work to do. I could go on for an hour, but I certainly won't. Alice or Heather, any, any thoughts that you might have? Uh, happy to, to chime in. Um, uh, Tony and I have talked about this before. I, I have long had this pet project of, of wanting to see a, a new M&A firm, uh, you know, sort of on the scale of a, of a Goldman Sachs um, that's dedicated just to M&A opportunities in the nonprofit sector, because there, there is such a complex environment out there. And, you know, Alice talked about being able to make a big difference in one thing and to, you know, to really do things at scale. And um, that is, I think, the, the one of the reforms or innovations that needs to occur going forward. And I, I think it's, I just sent uh, Alice a, a, a note on the, on the group chat here saying, you know, the idea that she is crossing over from one sector to the other and seeing sort of how the corporate side does things, I think is, is absolutely phenomenal. And obviously Tony, having been you know in the in the for-profit sector for such a long time before going to the seattle foundation also wonderful uh the you know the innovation um in both the, the understanding and the innovation across these multiple sectors i think is is crucial at this point um and then i wanted to say when i look at programs um ones that i really like are ones like fair start which are not only filling an immediate short-term need of food and food security but also getting people trained to do jobs uh, because ultimately, you know, having a job is the very best um, security uh, of all sorts that you can have. And so that ability to, to create um, training and turn around lives and allow people to, um, to, to you know, re-enter the, the uh, commercial sector, I think is, is just tremendous. So those, I think we'll see more of those models going forward as well. The, the two fur and three fur um, models where you really are um, creating economic opportunity at the same time that you are filling an immediate uh, sort of basic human need is, is going to be crucial. Thanks for that question, Emily, and, and hats off to you and the entire team at Fair Start to echo Tony's comments for the big pivot you all have made uh, to serve the community in this really challenging time. And if folks didn't see it, the Seattle Times had a great piece covering all the great work of Fair Start yesterday. Are there uh, additional questions? No, no other questions right now and we are at, we are at time, I believe. Well, I appreciate uh, each of you for, for joining us. And, and Tony started us out with a quote um, around, you know, America always does the right thing late. I think in a lot of ways, Seattle's doing the right thing now. Uh, because of folks like you and organizations uh, like the ones that you lead or are involved with. And we have the opportunity to continue to do the right thing now and, and take a leadership role in how we come together as a private nonprofit and public sector in response to uh, the economic devastation that's really racked our community and the vulnerable populations throughout our city and region. So I appreciate all that you're doing and for uh, joining us uh, today uh, and wish you a great rest of your uh, Thursday and the rest of your week. Stay safe, healthy, and, and be well. Thank you. Thank you, DSA. Great Thank job. you. Thanks, John.